you'll see videos of people claiming that the church just invented the doctrine of hell to control people with fear. Right. It's like we're just trying to, to keep our power, to keep you in the fold, prop up this institution yeah. of oppression. Alisa, thanks so much for coming back on Takeaways. It's always great to be with you. Last time we talked about questions of the faith, difficult questions of the faith, and the subject of deconstruction. And that's a big word. And, and you've come back for round two. I mean, I feel like you won the match with your first <laughs> bout with deconstruction, and now you're coming back. This is like, the comp why are you doing that? Well, I actually changed my mind on what deconstruction actually is. So in my first book, I talk about my own faith crisis that I went through, and I used the word deconstruction to describe that process. But now, as I studied the movement and the phenomenon of deconstruction, I realized that I actually didn't deconstruct. It was something else, because deconstruction is a very specific thing that's manifesting in culture, and it's very connected to postmodern philosophy. And so I actually correct myself in this book and say, I didn't actually deconstruct. That was a faith crisis. It was agonizing. It was years long, but it wasn't deconstruction. So then, what is deconstruction? I mean, it's a big word. You know, um, does it did you does it mean you fell apart? You decomposed? You de <laughs> what, what, what deconstructed? So deconstruction. How my co-author Tim Barnett and I define it in the book is that it's a postmodern process of rethinking your beliefs, but not regarding scripture as the standard. And that's really, I think, what the core idea of the deconstruction movement is, mm. is it's a shift of authority. So no longer in deconstruction are we looking to objective reality, absolute truth, and searching for answers within absolute truth to know what's real about God, about the Bible, about religion, about morals, about all these things. In deconstruction, that locus of authority is shifted to the self. So now mm. in deconstruction, uh, spiritual beliefs are assessed more on what you personally feel helped or harmed by, what you personally think is toxic or uh, healthy, oppressive or liberating. And so these are categories that are going to be employed in the deconstruction movement, but they're not looking to reality in, a, in an objective sense yeah. to find those answers. Because right. that's appealing to kind of a, a definition of truth that would be more like relativism. Like truth is just relative to each person's historical context, their maybe their ethnic background, their uh, where, where they live, what period of yeah. time they exist in. But truth doesn't work like that because truth is just, it reflects reality. It's what you say or a statement that reflects what's real. It corresponds with reality. And so... Um, this is, um, people usually enter into this deconstruction. Uh, and so, again, to get to a definition, it's rethinking your faith. And then rather than looking to scripture mm -hmm. and reality to help me really understand what my faith and spiritual world is about, I'm looking to something else. And that something else, that else is how I feel. That's right. Yes. And that's why I changed my mind because I went through a faith crisis where I basically busted everything down to the studs. I, I took it all apart. I reassessed, okay, what do I believe? What, what is true? What do I true? think about the Bible? Exactly. Do I really think Jesus was uh, born of a virgin and exactly. rose from the dead? Yes, and so, and then I looked to reality and evidence, and that's really what led me into apologetics. And it was, it was grueling. It and was that actually supported long. the faith that yes. you originally had. Yeah, I came to the conclusion that the core gospel that my parents had taught me was true. It's it stood up under scrutiny, but that's really not what's happening in the deconstruction movement. Because yours was an honest online. investigation of your faith, and then you used reliable tools to help you determine whether or not it was true. That's right. But what are people doing today? Well, in deconstruction, they it starts sort of with a presupposition that Christian doctrine, or at least those core doctrines, like things like being told you're a sinner, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he resurrected from the dead, that he's the only way to God, that there's a place called hell. These are viewed as toxic theology. And that's ultimately in the deconstruction movement, what people are leaving behind is, is toxic theology. And so any sort of a proposition that would require something of you to say like, like Kirk, you're a sinner, you need a savior. Well, that's a toxic because they don't actually believe that these things can be known. And so when the Christian comes along claiming to know things about reality, about God and about morals, they just assume you're trying to control me with fear. Uh, in fact, very often in that deconstruction hashtag, you'll see videos of people claiming that the church just invented the doctrine of hell to control people with fear. Right. It's like, we're just trying to, to keep our power, to keep you in the fold, prop up this institution yeah. of oppression. Right. Wow. And so 
people are doing this. Is this common? Is this going on uh, everywhere in youth groups in certain denominations? I think it's happening everywhere because it's largely a phenomenon of social media. In our book, we quote from TikTok videos that many of which have millions of views and hundreds of thousands of likes claiming things like, hey, being told you're a sinner is abusive or being told that hell exists is psychologically damaging to children. These videos are getting millions of views and hundreds of thousands of likes. What can we do as, let's say, parents to detect if our children are going down this path of deconstructing because they know it's probably not something mom and dad would be happy to hear about, yeah. that we're questioning my faith. I'm not sure I believe the Bible. Uh, I may not want to be a Christian anymore. Are there telltale signs or things that we can ask our kids to find out if this is something that we need to deal with? Well, I think it's really important for Christian parents. This is something that I think about all the time because I have a 15-year-old and a 12-year-old. And what we try to do in our home is have really open and honest discussions about uh, the questions our kids have about the reliability of the Bible or, you know, for reading through scripture. And one of my kids says, well, did that really happen? That sounds a little far-fetched. You know, we just discuss those very calmly. We don't shame them for their questions. And so I think it's really important for Christian parents to have those conversations with their kids. But in order to detect an actual deconstruction, which again, as we're defining, it's, it's a process of rethinking your faith, but not regarding scripture as a standard. For a child or a teenager to be going through that, I think there would have to be some level of exposure to social media. And so I think parents who have teenage kids and younger have a lot of power to help stem the tide of deconstruction by limiting their kids' interaction with social media. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't expose them to those ideas. In fact, I, Tim, my, my co-author, Tim Barnett, has the Red Pen Logic Instagram you know, and TikTok where he literally takes videos and will correct them with a red pen. And so I think it's great to pull a TikTok video to show your kids of yeah. maybe a deconstructionist saying, hey, Christians are abusive and talk it through with your kids in the safety of the home where you are discipling them. But if they are actually deconstructing, there's probably a good chance there's some outside influence that you could, you could actually kind of control a little bit more maybe. Right. How is deconstruction shaping culture right now? Mm. Interesting question. I'm not sure if deconstruction is shaping culture or if culture has shaped the movement of deconstruction because the movement of deconstruction is very postmodern. So it's hallmarked by a rejection of the idea that absolute truth could be known when it comes to religion and morality. So most postmodern people, they're not gonna walk around as if truth is relative in all areas, but in those two areas, religion and morality, they've sort of put those in the category of opinion or preference, like what's your favorite ice cream? It would be weird for me to say, no, Kirk, you shouldn't like vanilla, you should like chocolate. I mean, everybody would be like, well, that's yeah. weird because that's an opinion, yeah. right? And so our culture at large has put religion and morality in that category of opinion. And so I think that is what has caught fire to the deconstruction movement because they've sort of adopted that as a presupposition. And then, then it's like, well, if the church told me X, Y, or Z is true, and I must believe that, or I will be condemned to a place called hell, that's obviously oppressive. That because they couldn't know these things. Because it's just opinion. It's, yeah, because it's just in the opinion so, category. And so I think that it's the postmodern culture that has really probably more influenced the phenomenon of deconstruction rather than the other way around. But that's kind of a guess. I don't, yeah. I don't I haven't really thought when about we, that. Before. But if someone has rejected the scriptures as an authority and sees Christianity and its tenets as oppressive, that certainly is then going to have a trickle-down effect and shape the culture, our idea of family, Absolutely. our idea of government. What we discovered as we were researching for this book is that very often in that deconstruction space, the leaders of the movement will tell you not to land on anything solid. In fact, there's a very popular YouTube channel and Instagram uh, channel that is telling you don't form new beliefs. Because when you deconstruct, if you form new beliefs, then you'll just have to deconstruct those. So just always be asking questions. In fact, the same deconstructionist said, I think questions are the answers, which of course is self-refuting because that's not a question. That's actually a statement that he's sinking his teeth into and standing on, right? And so I think there's a lot of a, a self-refuting nature in a lot of this that interestingly, you know, for apologists, that's very frustrating because we're truth people and we want to be like, well, I've just shown you your logical fallacy. Don't you see? <laughs> you know? yeah. But in the deconstruction movement, it's like, they, they don't care. They almost feel attacked. 
if things like logic and reason are brought into the conversation and if it's brought outside of a of the lens of self really and, and a self-led process of trying to find what works for you or what you feel is liberating for you. Mm-hmm. But again, that's all self-referential. That's not based on anything on the outside. So when somebody rejects Christianity and the Bible as their ultimate authority, and they say, here's my new self, um, and I don't believe in anything anymore, and I'm just questioning everything, isn't that their new orthodoxy? It is. And don't they have their own sets of priests uh, who are telling them that these things are gospel truth? Okay. Explain that a little bit. Yeah, this is a very interesting question because uh, we had to cut a lot out of the book because we had written way too many words. And one of the things that did not make it into the book was this section that I had written on comparing the deconstruction movement to a religion. Because in the name of getting rid of religion and divesting themselves of organized religion, in a way, they've constructed a new one. So like you mentioned, they have priests and prophets, the spokesmen and the leaders of the movement. Who are their priests and prophets? So these would be the Instagram and TikTok, uh, TikTokers and Instagrammers who are putting out, no kidding, Kirk, 20 second videos that challenge something about Christianity that everybody buys into, even though it's easy to refute these things. These are demonstrably false, but it doesn't matter because in that hashtag, it's it's an echo chamber. It works a lot like propaganda. So people see, oh, hundreds of thousands of people like this. It must be true. Now I have a reason to leave this toxic theology. So you have the, the priests and the prophets. You have the evangelism. You have, it's very evangelistic, this movement. They want you to leave your toxic theology. They're not just content to and be, be like- converted And be converted, that's exactly right. They don't want to just walk away quietly and go, gosh, I just don't believe anymore. You know, you do you, I'll do me. It's very evangelistic. And there's a, a sense of the, of the testimony. You know, Christians go around and they tell their testimonies. Yeah. Well, that's what the deconstruction story is, is it's a, it's a testimony. And instead of the great commission, there's the great decommission. So it's very religious in nature, in my view. And which is very interesting because they're doing all of this in the name of getting rid of the chains of what they would call organized religion. What are some of the, things that are happening to people that is moving them to deconstruct? Well, I have some theories. I mean, some of it's going to be speculation. In the book, we really don't speculate on the question of, you know, if people deconstruct, were they really a Christian in the first place? We don't really go there. But it's my personal suspicion that because of the rise of the seeker-sensitive model, uh, the megachurch model, and I want to be clear, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having a large church or something like that, but with uh, the more seeker-sensitive message and maybe the watering down of the gospel in many churches, I think there's a lot of people who grew up in church. They like Christianity. They speak the language. They like the community of it. But maybe they never trusted in Christ for themselves, and they may not even realize that they're not a Christian. And then a crisis comes. Maybe it's the moral failing of their pastor or the mishandling of that moral failing by the church leadership, or maybe it's legalism or whatever else it might be, church abuse. And those two things come together. And then it's like, well, this whole thing is unsafe. I don't, and and I have a lot of compassion for that, by the way, because I think spiritual abuse is very real and it disorients people. And then they don't really know where the solid ground is and that, and they can be candidates for deconstruction. Yeah. What can pastors do to prepare their congregations for this kind of unraveling of the the faith of some? I I would say there are three really, really important things that every pastor could do. In fact, we have a a whole chapter on questions and we address pastors a lot in that chapter. Um, Number one, pastors need to speak clearly and confidently about issues of what's going on in culture as that would relate to scripture. Their congregations need to be biblically literate because what you find in that deconstruction movement is a lot of misunderstandings and mischaracterizations of what the Bible has to say. Mm -hmm. Um, People will say, you'll, you'll see a deconstructionist say, I know the Bible inside and out, sideways, backwards, front, back. I know the Bible. But then they'll make a statement that so displays how they don't know what the Bible says in its accurate context. So teaching the Bible, teaching your congregation the nature of truth, but also providing a space for questions. We actually encourage pastors to start a Q&A. If you can't do it every Sunday after the sermon, maybe do it on a Wednesday night. 
So where you're sending the message, questions are welcome here. We're not afraid of questions. And so that provides your people the opportunity to maybe ask some of those questions that they thought, well, maybe I wasn't supposed to ask this, but now they know that it's safe to ask those questions. But as we also point out in the book, sometimes those questions are answered, but the answers are not accepted. And that's often when somebody will say, well, I just don't like the answer. And so they'll claim the, an- the question wasn't answered that they really just didn't like the answer. But I think biblical literacy, Mm. teaching about the nature of truth, speaking with clarity, and maybe opening up a time of Q&A and and engaging with the movement of deconstruction, which also means defining it properly. And this is a huge, huge plea that we make in the book, is that there are a lot of well-meaning evangelical leaders that talk about deconstruction, and they'll say, well, just deconstruct in a healthy way. You know, use the Bible to deconstruct. But the problem with that is we're conceding language to what it really is, because that is not what is manifesting in the deconstruction hashtag. And that can be very confusing. So when we allow words to be defined in all these different ways, it just brings in a whole lot of confusion. So we'd love for pastors to educate their congregations about what deconstruction really is and what a better way is, which would be something like reformation, or I've heard people use the word disentangling bad beliefs from from true ones. All of that's great, but deconstruction means something else. And so let's keep those categories clear. That's so important. Words are truly, truly important. I like the word you used, reforming. Yeah. I'm reforming and I'm, I'm trying to get closer to the truth on these issues. And uh, I know where I can go to find truth in these, in these parts. And if you've got to go right to the very core, um, knock it down to the studs on whether or not the Bible is that standard, then you got to go there. I've had to go there myself yeah. and I've come to that conclusion. And, uh, and it's also interesting that whatever you do land on, for your ultimate standard of truth, you're going to have to hold that belief by faith. Yeah, Faith is, a, is an inescapable concept in, in the whole world. Even the atheist has faith that God does not exist. He right. can't prove it, but it's his religion. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> you know? and faith biblically means active trust. And everybody does that. We did that when we sat, sat down in, in the these chair. chairs. When like, I got on an airplane and yeah, flew to California. Exactly, exactly. And so I think there, I think the misunderstanding is that people think faith is blind. It's like a blind leap or believing something in spite of there not being evidence for it. But biblically, that's not it. There's plenty of evidence. And I think biblically, we're encouraged to look at the evidence. The heavens yeah. declare, right? That's it. We mentioned a, a friend, Stephen Meyer, and, and others. Um, and it seems like the scientific community somehow uh, uses all these facts and evidence to try to disprove the existence of God. But when you look at to the scientists, I believe, who are truly objective and follow the evidence all the way to the end, they, all of it terminates on the God of the Bible. Yeah. In fact, if you're honest, I don't think you can explain the most meaningful parts of life apart from the God of the Bible. Yeah. In fact, some atheists are intellectually honest enough to even admit this. There's a guy, Richard Lewontin, was a yes. Harvard, you probably know this the biologist quote. at Harvard. Yeah. He, he, there's a famous quote where he says, you know, we sometimes tolerate just unsubstantiated stories in the scientific community because we have this pre-commitment to this worldview of materialism, which excludes the supernatural. And he even said, because we can't not- allow a divine foot in the door. I remember that quote. It's a great quote. I cannot, we, can, we as scientists cannot allow a divine foot in the door, meaning we can't even let that come into the discussion because that's going to mess all of our thinking and our, all of our theories up. Yeah. Finally, if we do have kids that are walking away from their faith, that are saying, you know, I don't believe this stuff anymore. And they've got this online community of friends who are all cheering them on and making them feel supported. Um, what advice would you give just on a, on a, on a mom level, mm. on a dad level? Yeah. Uh, what, what can we do? I mean, maybe we have some responsibility in this. Maybe yeah. there's things that have happened in the church right. and in their faith experience that where they've not found the support and comfort and the healing that mm-hmm. they need. And, and that's part of it. Yeah, well, first let's address that. If there have been those things, I, we just would urge you as a parent to repent to your kid and, and let them know, look, I really blew it in this area. I wanna ask mm-hmm. you to forgive mm-hmm. me. 
Um, I wrestle with this myself, and I'm so sorry about that. If you know, if there's an opportunity to do that, but in many cases, the adult child has cut off their older parents, or maybe even not let them see their grandkids because they think they're toxic people and harmful people. And so the advice we give in the book, we have a whole chapter on this, but the advice we give is counterintuitive for Christians. But right. it's basically this: is that if there's tension in the relationship due to this, it's really okay to back off and just try to maintain the relationship first. It's kind of like triage. You know, find the what what is the most urgent need. Right. And if that's just maintaining the relationship, do that. Yeah. And then try to build that relationship so there can be conversations down the road. Right. But you're not going to probably fix their theology over a coffee date because this didn't happen over coffee. Yeah. This happened over a long period of time with lots of interlocking factors. So uh, just try to maintain that relationship. Pray. Don't es- underestimate the power of prayer mm. and living out the beauty of the gospel in front of them because, Kirk, I've been to the bottom of this rainbow in this deconstruction hashtag and there's no pot of gold there. And -hmm. I think there's gonna be a time coming when people get to the bottom and they realize that it's empty and it's toxic. And they're gonna look to their parents who have the joy and peace of Jesus, not that Mm. they're perfect. And they might go, maybe I do want what they have. That's exactly right. I know that's true. I know that's true. And and I've seen it in, in, in other areas of culture. People get to the end of the rainbow of communism, socialism, Mm -hmm. Marxism, and they say, there's no pot of gold here. There's no free lunch. And they go, where do we go? Where do we go? And and we can look back to heroes of the faith who embraced the Bible and the pilgrims and and those freedom fighters who embraced the values that actually lead to blessing. 